Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible class. Let's begin with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for opportunities to study your word. We're thankful for opportunities to glean your eternal wisdom so that we may become more like Jesus. Bless the study in Acts and may the inspiration of the Apostle Paul uh, touch each of our lives and make us more dedicated to the way. Now forgive us when we fail you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome. Uh, we're going to be in the uh, in the 20th chapter uh, of the book of Acts today. Uh, I'm hoping that we can get down through about, uh, oh, about half, maybe halfway, verse 24 or so uh, in today's lesson. Uh, so let's pick right up uh, in uh, Acts, the 20th chapter, uh, verse 1. Luke writes, as the uproar had ceased, or after the uproar had ceased, now the uproar that he's talking about was the, the artisans there in Ephesus who had, who had kind of got the entire city in an uproar. Uh, as, as you will recall from our last study, uh, the artisans made their livelihood from making these uh, small idols uh, to, uh, uh, to the, the Greek gods that were being worshipped there. Uh, Paul is coming in uh, and teaching that there is only one God. Uh, G, uh, Jehovah, and it was beginning to have an impact on their on their livelihood, and so there was an uproar. Uh, the 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 city the city town or the town clerk was able to kind of subdue them and get them down, uh, but that was somewhat of an event uh, that was the, that, that dominated the last half of the last chapter. So. We're going to pick right up in 20, and that's what that was talking about. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. Now, the reason that he left wasn't as a result of the, of the uproar. He had, already made the, he had already made the decision earlier. Uh, I guess you could go back to verse 21 of chapter 19. Now, after these things are finished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, and that's his own spirit. It's kind of like he, he made up his mind. Purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after that I've been there, I must go to Rome. So he had already made the decision. It had been at, it had been at Ephesus two or three, maybe four years, uh, a long, long time working there, and he realized it's just time to move on. So after this event, though, he kind of, uh, made the made the purposeful exit to uh, to to move on to his to his next destination. Uh, he left to go to Macedonia at the end of verse one. When he had gone through the districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. So, as has been Paul's mo in many cases, uh, he he goes back to places where he's already spent time, established churches. Church and does some extra teaching, does some correction, does some exhortation, encouragement as a general rule. And that's kind of the mo of what he's doing here. When he had gone through those districts and had given them max exhortation, he came to Greece, and there he spent three months. And interestingly, uh, during that three month period is the period of time when when Paul would write his Roman letter, which many will regard as. Uh, the pinnacle of human writing, uh, one of the greatest pieces of, of literature ever given, uh, certainly inspired by the Spirit, but from just a human perspective, uh, it's it's just sheer genius. Uh, so this was a, this was a high point in Paul's in Paul's ministry and his maturity as a Christian. Uh, just really, really a, an exciting time for the apostle. He was there three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews, as it seems like that happens everywhere he goes over a period of time. Uh, the Jews just kind of become jealous and be, begin to kind of want to, to, to run him out of town, and, and that's the case here again. There was a plot formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria. He decided to return through Macedonia. And he accompanied, and he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Phyrus, and of Aristarchus, and of Secondus, and of, of the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. <laughs> All hard to say. An unusually large uh, entourage for Paul here in this particular case. I think possibly uh, one of the things that might explain that uh, would be the amount of money that Paul had been, had been able to put together. And, and remember what he was doing. He had been visiting these different places, these different churches, and asking for gifts to give to the Jerusalem Jews who were, who were really in a difficult time here. So as he's kind of made all this final collection, 
is on his way essentially back to Jerusalem. He has a larger crowd, and again, many of the theologians and the commentators that I read uh, speculated the fact that he was carrying a significant sum of money, and he wanted to have them not only as his traveling companions, but almost as bodyguards, you might say. So again, somewhat speculation on our part, but it would it would it would make it would make it sense. But these had gone ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. Now, well, most likely that's the last two mentioned. That would be Tychicus and Trophimus, uh, who went ahead to Troas as, as he's venturing there and, 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 we're, and we're waiting on him there. And I think it's interesting, in, in the middle, at the end of verse, at the end of verse 5, uh, these had gone ahead and were waiting for us. At this point, Luke has rejoined the group, uh, and we're beginning to see the us and we statements that we've talked about time or time again. At some point, a couple of chapters back, a couple of chapters back, Paul had assigned or sent Luke uh, to another to another town to to work with the church. And at this point, he's kind of rejoined the the missionary effort uh, as they're heading back uh, toward Jerusalem. Waiting for us at Troas in verse six. We again includes Luke. We sail from. Philippi, after the days of unleavened bread, and came to and came to them at Troas. Within five days, and there and there we stayed seven days. So, just kind of a little bit of a, a historical inf- information there to kind of just kind of let let us know how Paul had had left Ephesus and it is now beginning this journey that will eventually end up at back at Jerusalem with him presenting the money. Uh, Verse seven is an extraordinary verse, uh, and and really uh, exceptionally important for us as as modern day Christians. Uh, as we try to interpret Scripture, the the hermeneutic or the the methodology that we use to interpret has always been kind of threefold. Uh, it has been what is directly commanded. Uh, whether it's by one of the New Testament writers or by the Savior Himself, we, we try to we try to find what where, where there are examples of the, what the apostles did, uh, and then third, what is inferred by by their teaching. We're going to get two of those in this next teaching, and it's really particularly important for us as as we know as we know what day our worship is to take care of or take place on, and what is the central focus of that, of that uh, event uh, when, whenever we gather to worship. And, and both of those are going to be found in, in this particular verse, verse 7. Uh, and, we're going to, and we're going to see uh, ex- an example of an apostle, Paul, and then uh, obviously what is, what is inferred there is, is equally as important. So let's pick up in verse 7. On the first day of the week, now that, that kind of sets the tone, you know, Worship for in the Old Testament, worship under the old law for the Jews was on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. Uh, with Christianity, you know, you, you might think, well, we're going to stay with with this Sabbath, but it, it changed with Christianity when Jesus died on the cross and the old law was was nailed to the cross and and, and fulfilled. the The day of worship also changed, and this is one of the passages that we get that tells us they worshipped on Sunday, so we worship on Sunday again. We try to emulate what they did through example. Uh, on the first day of the week, when we, again, Luke is including himself, when we were gathered together to to break bread. Now that's that's. There's kind of two different references to to breaking bread in the New Testament. One is is what is being referenced here. One is uh, to observe the Lord's Supper, uh, the bread, the the cup. Uh, the remembrance, the, the 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 ceremony that we get of, of remembrance for Jesus. The other uh, breaking bread, and it's going to be used in this same particular passage, is more just to eat a meal uh, for you know sustenance. Uh, and sometimes it becomes challenging to to differentiate the two and understand which one they're talking about. In this particular case, I think it's relatively straightforward. They were going to meet on the first day of the week with these other Christians for the purpose of observing the Lord's Supper and. That again is so important to us because that still remains our central focus. Now, we also sing, we pray, we give, uh, we also hear a message recorded from the from the from the Word, and we're going to see that here in just a moment here. But it, it's kind of like our steps of salvation. We try to look at the entire scope of the New Testament. For our worship, we do the same. We look and we see what are all the different things and the pieces that we can that we can put together that that that, that they did that we can emulate. Uh, so this is an extremely, extremely important one as we, as we look at this one. On the first day of the week, we were gathered to break bread. I mean, that the time and uh, what, the, what their focus was. Uh, 
Paul began talking to them, extending, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. So it was a general practice, historically we understand, that the Christians met after dark. So they already met late in the afternoon, uh, and that was for the purpose of, uh, of, uh, of uh, observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, so the question would be asked, is it appropriate for us to have a sermon, or is it appropriate for us to have a message delivered to us? Yes, because again, we have the example here of, of Paul doing that, that when they gathered for the Lord's Supper, they also had an opportunity to, to preach or to, to share information about the Word. Now, different from what we have today, where we have a very structured time frame, which is probably somewhat shorter, 20 to 30 minutes generally, uh, they didn't have the Word. They didn't have the, 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 the written Word like we do today. Their only source of knowledge of Jesus was, in many cases, when these, when these missionaries or apostles or traveling ministers uh, happened to be in, in, the, in, the, in the area. So to, to, to be able to sit at the feet of Paul was a treasure for these people. And so he's going to give them, and they're going to sit and, and absorb as much as they can. So the first segment of this is from late in the evening, until midnight, which is a long time. Uh, but that's kind of what we get. Paul began speaking then, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill. So, I mean, you can kind of, you can kind of see the scene here. You have, you have all these Christians that are gathered with this glorious opportunity to sit at the, at the feet of Paul and learn about Jesus. Uh, and then you have a young man over here who's just dead tired. <laughs> and so he climbs up in this windowsill and, and basically falls asleep. Uh, it was Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, so, I mean, he, he, had been, he had been going at it for several hours at this point, likely. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. Now, Remember, Luke is a physician, so Luke is giving some insight, which which clearly certifies that this young man is was was killed by this fall. Uh, it, it's it's a mix of of it being somewhat humorous as Paul preached so long that he put a young man to sleep, contrasted with uh, with the young man's uh, actual death. But listen to what happens because it's extraordinary. Verse ten: but Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, "Do not be troubled." For his life to back in him. To me, that's very reminiscent of the story of Jesus in Luke 8 uh, regarding the, the daughter of Jairus, uh, who had died, and Jesus showed up what would appear to be too late and uh, said that she's not dead, and, and the people there began to laugh at him, and he went over and, and raised her from the dead. Well, actually, he and Peter and the father went up into the upper room, and, and Jesus raised her from the dead. Uh, there, there's there's some similarities here, I think, uh, just between the they died and then immediately being being uh, raised from the dead. Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, "Do not be troubled, for his life is back on him." When he had gone back up and had broken bread and eaten, now keep in mind, remember, there's two different things that we talk about that, are, that use the same phraseology. Breaking bread is in, in earlier is indicating the observance of the Lord's Supper. This is an indication of they just had a meal. Uh, it's late, but I mean, Paul has been preaching now for several hours. He's going to keep on going. Uh, they stopped to eat again. He had gone back up and had broken bread and eaten. He talked with them a long time, a long, a long while until daybreak, and then left. So he had already preached till midnight. This young man had fallen out of the window and died. Paul went down and raised him from the dead. Came back up. They had a meal. And he preached it until sunlight. Uh, so, I mean, probably upwards of six or eight hours of, of, of teaching there by the Apostle Paul. Again, what, what a blessing uh, that any of us would certainly give uh, the opportunity for. But uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful how Luke has shared this. Uh, and then left. And so he, that they took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. So just an exceptional event there at Troas. So let's pick up at verse 13 and continue on. 
But we, going ahead to the ship, again, Luke includes himself in here. We've got these us and we statements, you know, that we haven't had for a chapter or two. But we, going ahead of the ship, set sail for Assos, intending from there to take Paul aboard. So, so for, for so he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. So what, what's going to happen is they are, think about this peninsula, and they're on one side of the peninsula. They're going to take the ship and go uh, down around the peninsula and come up to this other city. And Paul is just going to walk across the land. Uh, we don't know why Paul arranged for that. If it was an opportunity to teach, if it was he just needed some some time to for, for prayer and reflection. We, we just really don't know. But that's the case. The group, very likely taking the money with them, uh, the group took the ship and went around, and they're going to meet him at this town on the other side of the peninsula. And again, Paul's just going to walk across. But we, going ahead of the ship, set out to sail for Assos, intending from there to take Paul on board, for so he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. Verse 14, And when he met us in Assos, we took him on board, and we went to, to Mytilene. Apologize, I'm not sure the pronunciation of that particular word. And what we're going to see here, and, and I... I think what we're going to see is there's a this is somewhat of a, a merchant ship that's kind of going to kind of go from port to port to port to port. Uh, whether or not there was stops and layovers there, we just don't know. But that's what we're going to see in this next verse. Sailing from there, we arrived the following day opposite Chios, and the next day we crossed over to Samos, and the day following we crossed over to Miletus, which is their which is their destination. Uh, so again, just historical information that that the apostle is. Uh, or that, that Luke is sharing of, of the journeys of the Apostle Paul. So we'll pick up in 16. <coughs> Pardon me. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time there in Asia. Now keep in mind, Paul had Paul had already had already he had been there three or four years and he had already kind of had a, his departure. Uh, they were kind of coming back by and he wanted to have the moment with the elders to encourage them. Uh, and but he didn't want to go back into town because it was just going to be it would just prolong his it would just prolong his stay there and and, and this is important because it tell, Luke tells us why I'm going to reread verse 16 and Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not be so that he would not have to spend time in Asia and here's the reasoning for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem if possible by the day of Pentecost most commentators speculate the reason he was wanting to be in in Jerusalem by Pentecost is remember he's got this large gift to present to the Christians there. It's also an opportunity when the largest crowd is going to be at Jerusalem, and it would just be a, a real positive experience for the church there to be able to say, hey, here's all this money that we raised for Christians to help. Uh, just a, an opportunity again for, for wonderful teaching. So, but, but, but Paul knew that time was of the essence. Uh, and he knew that if, went, if he went back into Ephesus, he just wouldn't get away in time. But he wanted to talk to the elders. Turn, if you have your New Testament open, turn to Revelation, the second chapter. In Revelation, the second chapter, we have the Savior giving a... Uh, talking to seven different churches, and one of them is Ephesus. And I think it's interesting. As, as Paul goes in, he really is going... To, back in Acts, he's really going to go back to... He's really going to go to a lot of effort to... To, to encourage these 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 Ephesian elders to remain faithful and to, uh, to be, be on the lookout for for false teachers etc this in, in revelation would be later and and we're going to see that there was some problems in Ephesus uh, and uh, you know one must wonder, did Paul have some insight on that? Uh, and was that one of the reasons why he went to such effort to encourage these these uh, these, these Ephesian elders uh, again to to watch out for ravenous wolves, as as we would say? But listen to the, let's pick up in uh, let's pick up in uh, in Revelation chapter two to the angel of the church in Ephesus. All right. Uh, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands, says this, and basically Jesus is talking about himself. Verse two is where it gets really it gets really pertinent. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. So, the Savior initially in this in this letter encourages him and says what you're doing is good you're, you're watching out for ravenous wolves and that's exactly what paul is going to encourage them to do verse three and for and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake 
They have not grown weary. So from one aspect, they're really doing a good job. But listen to this, uh, verse 4. But I have this against you. And this is Jesus talking to this church. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And what was their first love? Their first love is, is uh, the, the faithful obedience to Jesus. Uh, and it would appear that, that from, from this letter that they had gotten a little dogmatic maybe uh, and, were, and were doing some things, but they had failed to appreciate the importance of love. Uh, and... I, I, I just have to wonder as we go back to uh, to Acts the, the the 20th chapter is that is this kind of what Paul knew was coming uh, why he was giving this church such encouragement uh, and and such such praise uh, so let's pick up let's pick up with that story but I, I, I think that understanding the background about what is going to happen later is important in helping us understand what what Paul is going to be saying here. Verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Now, they will also be called later in this chapter bishops. Uh, elders are called uh, shepherds. They're called overseers. They're called presbyters. There's about seven different things all talking about the same group of men uh, throughout the New Testament, uh, just different names that they have been, that they have been given. Uh, to, personally, the, the concept of overseer, overseer of the church, uh, overseer of the affairs of the church uh, is one that gives great credence. Shepherds also, in my mind, gives, gives great credence. The, the idea of, of being watchful uh, over, over the flock. So, but again, uh, numerous, description, numerous names are used to describe the same group of people here, elders of the church. Verse 18, when they had come to him, he said to them, and he kind of, he kind of set the picture here. You've got Paul. He's fixing to head off to Jerusalem. He knows he's likely not ever going to see him again. So he's taking one last opportunity to take these, these leaders of the church and give them some encouragement, knowing likely what may, the future may bring. Middle of verse 18, you yourselves know that from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. And again, that was about three or four years. So he had spent a considerable amount of time. Many of these likely were ones that he had baptized and brought in and matured and grew their faith to the point where they could become the shepherds of the congregation. You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. If you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 33, you can read a list of the things that were done to Paul. And it's extraordinary. Beatings, just the... the, the an overwhelming list of, of sufferings that he endured, yet his faith remained strong. And, and, and that's kind of, I think, what he's talking here. Serving the Lord with all humility and tears with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. So Paul's ministry was not just to go into the synagogues and preach. Paul's ministry was to do that in the streets and go from house to house teaching. I mean, what an example of personal ministry was the Apostle Paul. Uh, continue on in verse 21. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of the repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I guess we would say preaching the gospel telling the story of Jesus, telling the, the good news, uh, and, and just kind of reiterating to the kind of building historical background for these, uh, for these particular elders. Verse 22, And now, behold, bound in spirit. Now that, that particular passage is not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's talking about Paul's own decision to, to his own motivation, you might say, that it's time to move on and it's time to go to Jerusalem, which he knew there was going to be some problems there, but that's what that's talking about. And now behold, bound in spirit, his own spirit, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Uh, Paul's fame, I guess you would say, for lack of a better term, has grown. Jews everywhere are now pretty much aware when he shows up there's going to be there's going to be uh, uh, an opportunity to maybe kill him uh, and they've, they've tried many times over and over and Paul's aware of that uh, you know he balances what we had in back in I believe it's chapter 18 where the Lord himself spoke to him and said take courage and now he's now he's hearing from the Holy Spirit you you've got some trials ahead of you uh, and those two things must tug at Paul's spirit as he goes on. But listen to what he listen to what he says here. Uh, I think it's just I think it's just absolutely beautiful. And now, being bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, 
except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city. The Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city. You know, throughout the book of Acts, we've seen a lot of different examples of the way the Holy Spirit communicated to Paul. Uh, visions, uh, directly speaking. I mean, there's just, a, there's just a myriad of different ways. Here is, is interesting. Turn over to the next chapter, chapter 21, verse 4. Uh, now, keep in mind what he was just talking about. The Holy Spirit was testifying him in every city. He gives a little bit more insight in chapter 21, verse 4. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. So the Spirit was working through these disciples to tell Paul there, there's, there's trouble ahead. But it did, it, fortunately, it didn't deter Paul. And then you go down to verse 10. Uh, that's just regular disciples. Verse 10 verse of chapter 21. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt. So, I mean, kind of visualize this. This man walks in. There's Paul standing there. He removes Paul's belt and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In, the, in this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So what a graphic way. I mean, he comes off, he takes Paul's belt, he binds himself up, and he says, this is what's going to happen to the man who owns this belt. Paul. <laughs> so uh, just really a, a graphic way of, of, of the Holy Spirit speaking to Paul uh, through disciples and through this prophet Agabus. Uh, again, just a, just a little bit of insight there about what is happening. So, uh, I'm going to turn to the wrong page. Except the Holy Spirit, verse 23, except the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But listen to verse 24. And we're going to stop at this particular verse here, but I think it may be one of the most encouraging verses that, that, you, can, that you can find in the New Testament. Here is a man that the Holy Spirit himself is saying, challenges are in front of you. And for many of us, we might be tempted to take that as a warning that we need to shirk away, that we need to hide, uh, but not the Apostle Paul. Uh, he met these challenges kind of head on, and, and to me, verse 24 is just a testament to his, to his spirit. Uh, listen to what he says. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Uh, Paul, he wrote and he lived and he spoke that Jesus was preeminent and such an encouragement for us as Christians today uh, as we face difficulties and there's temptation to blame God or temptation to allow our faith to be to be impacted. Uh, Paul, even with the knowledge that bad things were coming, uh, remained faithful and focused uh, on on his on his mission efforts. Uh, to me, to me, it's just one of the most absolutely encouraging things that, that you can read. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course. Uh, you know, and, and here's a man who is at the height of his of his Christianity, of his Christian walk, uh, writing these letters to the Galatians and to the Ephesians and to the Corinthians, soon to be writing letters back to the Ephesians, uh, and. He, you might say he's right in the middle of his course, and he recognizes that. Uh, I love to contrast that with you go all the way over to Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven and eight, where where he is at, where he is at the end of his ministry, at the end of his course, and he's reflecting back, and he says, "I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me." the crown of righteousness which the Lord Himself will award on that day. And not to me alone, but unto all those who have loved His appearance. I, I love to contrast these two. Right in the middle of His course and at the end of His course, however it played out, it was all for Jesus. Uh, and, and, and that's what this verse speaks to me. Uh, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Wow. I, like I say, to me, verse 24 is just, it's the summit of, of, what, of what a Christian's life should be. Uh, it's, it's solely about Jesus. It's solely about living for, for what He has done for us and the promise that He's giving us and the expectation that we have 
to be with Him. Let's stop there this week, and we'll pick up in verse 25 next week and probably finish up the rest of the chapter. Next week's a really interesting chapter. Uh, it's one of the very few places where we, where we get some insight on, on the duties and the responsibilities of elders. Uh, very telling. Uh, Peter has a little bit of this uh, in 1 Peter, and then, of course, Paul here uh, put those two together in some other passages and really get some good insight on the responsibility and the burden of being an elder. Uh, so let's close with a prayer and finish the day. Our God, we're thankful. We're thankful for the inspiration that we receive from this, this great man, this great apostle, this great, this great servant of Jesus named Paul. Uh, we're thankful for Luke being so diligent to record it. And we pray that some piece of, of what Paul shared with us in his life, in his sufferings, may make us more like Jesus. Forgive us when we fall short, our God. Love us always, we ask. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.